So the gaming industry kind of sucks. Well, after the news of Insert most recent game studio controversy here Where it was revealed that the company was Insert horrible working conditions here We're once again forced to draw our attention to the dark side of this industry We've got another uh, I don't know, like a month or so before everyone except Jim Sterling stops talking about this stuff So I have to get a video out now to get a hold of that sweet, sweet YouTube algorithm traffic the beginning of the 21st century saw a shift in the gaming industry, one that began to cater towards shareholders and executives rather than designers and consumers. As gaming became the most profitable form of entertainment on the planet and made a handful of people very, very rich, hitting deadlines for release windows became the name of the game. The inherent volatility that comes with making video games makes it extremely difficult to plan and quantify how much time any given project needs. But because studios and developers have to answer to publishers, corporate executives, and the ever-changing and easily distracted whims of the general public, the people who actually make these games are rarely afforded the time and labor they need to make their art while maintaining a reasonable work-life balance. The inevitable end stage of this business model, coupled with the lack of any significant regulations, naturally leads to worker exploitation. Crunch culture, widespread sexism, high turnover, and an overall toxic work environment seems to, sadly, be the norm for many of these companies. I don't have the answers to solve all the issues that plague this industry, and for better or worse, this won't be that kind of video. I'm just a consumer. My contribution to the gaming industry begins and ends with me talking about how much I hate Mario Party 8. But our collective consumer consciousness tends to have a pretty short attention span, one that is at least in part, what allows these companies to continue to operate with little to no consequences. While I can't offer any substantive change to the game developers that have created many of the products that I love, I can't offer them my attention. And when you add up the collective hours and hours that these people have created for me just to make my life a little bit better, my attention is the least they deserve. So what is it about video games that seems to create such a toxic work culture? At its core is the monumental task that is the creation of a video game. It straddles an odd line between art and science. Many have described making a video game like making a movie while building the camera. Let's say you're making an action adventure game where one of its core mechanics is a sword that causes shifts in the game world's gravity whenever it's swung. You spend months in pre-production figuring out how it's gonna work, you design overworld puzzles around it and it's even directly tied into the game's lore and story. Well, what happens if that mechanic focus tests poorly, or maybe the executive in charge doesn't like it, or as the mechanic morphs from an idea to a concrete aspect in the game? It's just not fun. You're now in a situation where you have to scrap one of your game's core mechanics and come up with something in its place. If you're lucky, maybe your publisher will allow you to push back the game by a few months. The more likely situation is that you're probably locked into a set release date, either through publisher mandate or maybe that's just when your indie studio is gonna run out of money. The only way to replace the sword gravity mechanic and hit your release date is to crunch like fucking crazy. Keeping on the schedule your project manager set up at the beginning of the development process simply isn't possible in a lot of cases. Because you can't assess how well something works in a video game before it's actually built. Another issue comes with the fact that the gaming industry is built on passion. Like many other creative fields, game designers are willing to work long hours, skip meals, and lose sleep in order to see their vision come to fruition. Hell, I make stupid videos about Nintendo bullshit and I've done all those things. Considering the gaming industry is insanely profitable, naturally there will be some people in suits who stand to make a lot of money and will take advantage of a designer's passion for the medium in order to shove out games quicker and more frequently. It isn't out of the ordinary for job postings to specifically seek out quote unquote passionate individuals, which just means that they want artists who have a natural inclination towards perfectionism because it makes it easier to exploit them for profit. Well, at least the actual gamers are understanding, right? Now, long hours, perfectionism, and passion are far from exclusive to gaming. The closest comparable industry on the creative side is film and television. 12-hour workdays are standard on film sets, television writers crash on office couches while breaking down scripts, and showing up to work at odd hours depending on your shoot schedule are all normal. The difference is that the film industry has unions that still hold a significant amount of power against corporate interests, with union productions having a minimum turnover time so actors and crew 
crew can rest properly between days, a set amount of base pay, and rules and regulations about mealtime, set safety, sick leave, overtime pay, all that. And since nearly all film work is contractual, most of these unions offer health insurance when actors or crew find themselves out of work, which is a pretty big fucking deal in countries like the United States because no one loves us here. Interestingly, if you look at the history of Hollywood pre-unions, or if you read about some modern productions that are non-union, it isn't uncommon to hear stories and working conditions that closely mirror what is going on in the gaming industry now. And fun fact, in parts of Hollywood that aren't unionized, like the visual effects industry, you basically see the exact same issues that are happening in gaming. And look, don't get me wrong, those few things are far from the only contributing factors that led to the gaming industry being in the state it is now. But I think it's a good jumping off point, and it'll help us kind of make sense of all the horrible things we're about to read. Also, real quick, yeah, I know the gaming industry isn't the only one where you're asked to work long hours, weekends, evenings, and all that. But just go ahead and look at the title of this video. The topic is the gaming industry, so that's what we're focusing on. If your knee-jerk reaction is to dismiss the complaints of these developers because you also face similar working conditions, maybe, just maybe, you're being exploited too. The Early Days Many game developers have spoken about crunch culture being a relatively recent phenomenon. Well, if you consider the early 2000s recent. Oh my god, Luigi's Mansion is almost 20 years old, I'm gonna fucking die soon. While the industry's early years were certainly filled with crazy stories and a sort of Wild West attitude, things were different. Gaming was not a multi-billion dollar industry. The designers were mostly software developers who transitioned into gaming, most having not grown up with video games being a core part of their identity, unlike basically every modern dev. That being said, shit was still kinda fucked. Ever wonder why so many early games credit their designers with pseudonyms? No, it wasn't about how wacky and cool they thought they were being by calling themselves Yuki-chan's papa, but it actually was a means to divest the developers of bargaining power. How could you go about getting a higher paying job at a different company if you couldn't explicitly prove that you worked on Castlevania? How could that company track you down to offer you a better position if your name is nowhere on the credits? And then there's fun things like Electronic Arts Artist Symposium, an event organized by EA CEO Trip Hawkins. The Artist Symposium was a weekend getaway, a collection of EA's various developers gathered together to celebrate their hard work and achievements. However, one year developers got together and started comparing notes notes figuring out who was getting paid more and who was doing more work. Naturally, workers who were getting paid less began to object, and old Trippy Hawkboy cancelled the artist symposium, stating that he wouldn't fund an event that enabled his developers to band against him. By the way, around this time, Hawkins' net worth was estimated to be in the ballpark of a hundred million dollars. But perhaps the most shocking of all these early gaming culture accounts comes from a small article published in the July 1994 issue of the Japanese gaming magazine B Mega Drive. The article, titled The Game Industry's Negative Side, was written by Hiroshi Ayuchi, probably best known for his work on games like Gunstar Heroes and Ikaruga. Ayuchi tells a harrowing story about collapsing multiple times, eventually leading to a hospitalization due to years of overworking himself. Your physical strength and your motivation will wither to nothing after just three or four years. I can't say that this will be the case for everyone, but I want those of you who are about to enter this industry to be aware that such situations do exist. And for those of you who consider yourself artists or skilled craftsmen, please be especially careful. It's possible that your high level of motivation can lead you into a hopeless situation. By the way, his statement about being withered after three or four years isn't hyperbolic. Turnover is insanely high in the gaming industry, and it isn't uncommon to refer to people who have been working in the industry for just five years as veterans. In 1994, I'm guessing a lot of consumers would have probably dismissed Ayuchi as alarmist, but looking at this through modern eyes, it's an ominous warning sign for what the industry would eventually turn into. Which leads us to... The EA Spouse Blog Post in the fall of 2004, less than a year after EA nabbed the number 91 spot on Fortune's top 100 best companies to work for, an anonymous live journal blog post would end up going viral. The post was titled EA, The Human Story, penned by an author simply titled EA Spouse. The blog goes on to tell a harrowing story of the author's spouse's work schedule at EA. Working 9am to 10pm, 7 days a week for months, no overtime or bonus compensation, employees falling ill 
from exhaustion. Her spouse had been essentially duped into joining the company. A fancy office building, the prestige of working in AAA, and a nice benefits package served as smoke and mirrors to drag in young developers, work them into the ground to ship out a project until the majority of them quit, and then repeat the process. All as a means for the billion dollar company to cut costs by burning their workers to the ground instead of hiring enough designers, artists, and programmers to ship out the project on schedule without excessive crunch. And just to make you feel worse, then EA CEO Larry Probst would end up earning $12.9 million in compensation during 2005. Management and executives would dismiss complaints by retorting that disgruntled employees could get another job. But as EA spouse notes, the company's exponential growth led to that being more and more difficult. Giant video game companies were acquiring and dissolving smaller studios faster than they could pop up. In a particular piece of depressing irony, the three examples that the author gives as standard alone studios that were able to make it work on their own, Blizzard, Bioware, and id Software, would all go on to get swallowed up by various corporate machines. Id was sold to ZeniMax Media in 2009, Blizzard came under the Activision Blizzard banner after a merger in 2008, and Bioware would end up being acquired by fucking EA. The fallout of the EA spouse blog post was pretty substantial. Any doubts to the validity of the disgruntled author were quickly askewed when, only a day after the blog went up, GameSpot would reveal that a group of EA employees were in the processes of initiating a class action lawsuit against the company, with the hopes of getting a payout to make up for hours and hours of unpaid overtime. A few months later, a second class action lawsuit against EA would be filed by Leander Hasty, an engineer who had been working for EA since June of 2003. Hasty was seeking undisclosed back pay, damages, and penalties for himself and fellow workers. EA would settle the first suit in October of 2005, dealing out $15.6 million in damages to various employees. In April 2006, the second suit would be settled, with EA dealing out $14.9 million to various current and former programmers. The settling of the suit came right when the EA spouse would reveal herself as Erin Hoffman, herself a video game developer. Hoffman was also revealed to be the wife of Leander Hasty, the engineer who filed the second class action suit against EA. While EA was receiving the brunt end of the media attention due to its labor practices, they were far from the only ones. Around the same time, Bungie was going through a hellish development period trying to ship out Halo 2 in time for Christmas 2004. 15 to 18 hour days, 7 days a week, for months on end. The game's lead engineer, Chris Butcher, described the attitude in Bungie during the crunch for Halo 2 as, quote, Oh my god, we're fucked. We're all going to die. People almost died so this could happen. In 2004, the International Game Developers Association conducted a survey that revealed that 21% of developers had crunch periods that lasted for more than two months. 44% stated that they worked 65 to 80 hours during crunch periods, 56% revealed that they would experience crunch before every milestone, and a whole bunch of other horrible things. While I'm sure many other companies were operating under similar circumstances as EA, none would draw the same media attention as the EA spouse blog post until the wives of Rockstar San Diego with the release of Rockstar's highly anticipated Red Dead Redemption only a few months away, an anonymous blog post would drop on Game of Sutra, eerily mirroring the EA Spouse blog. The post was penned by several spouses of Rockstar San Diego employees, noting excessive crunch was leading to mental and physical health problems, including even making one developer have suicidal thoughts. Workers trying to visit doctors on Saturdays were expected to use their sick days and were looked down upon by management. Unpaid overtime was justified by state that the company was in a tough spot financially. Meanwhile, Rockstar was also paying zero dollars in corporate tax in the UK through a loophole while also accepting subsidies from the UK government and giving their executives and upper management billions of dollars in bonuses. Several anonymous and former Rockstar employees would corroborate the claims in the blog post, with one employee comparing Rockstar's corporate offices in New York to the fucking Eye of Sauron. As a response, Rockstar released three wallpapers showing an eye watching over- Who, who the fuck was Rockstar's PR manager? Guys, Sauron was the bad guy. Unsurprisingly, this wasn't actually Rockstar's first issue with unfair labor practices. Only a few years earlier, they had been hit with a class action suit, filed on behalf of over 100 Rockstar employees because of unpaid overtime. Rockstar would end up settling that suit out of court and awarded the employees $2.7 million in compensation. 
So how did Rockstar decide to address this new batch of concerns? They issued a non-apology and laid off about a quarter of the Red Dead Redemption team only three months after its release. But don't worry, dear viewer, we will be returning to Rockstar shortly. Jason Schreier's The Horrible World of Video Game Crunch article. Okay, it may seem weird to include an article about crunch culture in the canon of game studios exploiting their workers, but I think there's a strong argument to include this piece. For those unaware, Jason Schreier is a video game journalist, known for his work with publications like Kotaku and Bloomberg, as well as his books Blood, Sweat, and Pixels and Press Reset, which you should definitely read if you want to know more about the inner workings of the gaming industry. Schreier became known as the sort of crunch guy. His exposés on the industry are some of the most seminal and complete works when it comes to reporting to mainstream audiences about the less than optimal conditions that many game companies operate under, Schreier's contacts in these studios gave him an unobstructed look at crunch culture and game developer exploitation. In 2015, Schreier would publish an article on Kotaku titled The Horrible World of Video Game Crunch, featuring candid interviews and statements from developers in the indie and AAA world. Within the context of mainstream consumer discourse, Schreier's piece brought awareness to crunch culture to a new level. Of course, there were pieces like the EA spouse that got covered and discussed everywhere, but to most gamers outside of the industry, worker exploitation was, generally, thought to be something contained in whatever studio was the topic of the day. Websites like Gamasutra and GameIndustry.biz spoke about crunch more, but both sites were geared more towards developers and insiders rather than consumers. Schreier's story changed that. The article made the rounds, alerting many gamers and others outside of the industry that crunch culture was not exclusive to EA a rock star, but rather, it was ubiquitous with creating video games. The piece opens with a brief story about Jessica Chavez, a writer and text editor who was, at the time, working for Xseed Games. After working brutal 14-hour days, six days a week for the last nine months, she lopped off a huge chunk of her hair out of frustration, lacking the time during the development of Legends of Heroes Trails of the Sky to even go to the barber. The rest of the article features similar stories, all different, yet her horrific in their own way. It highlighted the unpredictable nature of the industry, the existential threat of running out of money that led to crunch in the indie world, and the pressure of publisher deadlines and focus group inspired changes that haunted the AAA world. A developer who worked on Skyrim noted how the last few months of the game were a literal hell, stating that their quote, bug queue never slowed. Let's pause and think about that for a second. We all know what Skyrim looked like after release. Can you imagine what eldritch mess of mangled pixels and clipping horses this game looked like before it came out? Schreier noted that crunch wasn't even just done on acclaimed games. A developer on Iron Man 2 stated that the team worked mandatory 12-hour, 6-day work weeks with unpaid overtime. And a month before the game's release, Sega shut down the studio and laid off every single worker. All for this. While crunch culture continued on after the Kotaku article went live, there was a demonstrable shift of awareness in it to most gamers. Now you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who plays games that isn't at least tangentially aware of the widespread exploitation of video game developers, and a lot of that shift begins with Schreier's story. Riot Games and the Manager Who Would Fart on People Riot Games, the American subsidiary of the also-might-be-evil megacorporation Tencent, creator of a game that is in the running for the most toxic online community in gaming and general company that has made some pretty horrifically bad takes, came under fire in 2018 after a Kotaku article written by Cecilia De Anastasio alleged that the company had a long history of gender discrimination, sexual harassment, and an overall bro culture that created a toxic work environment for Riot's female employees. Also, like, you know, anyone who, like, cares what people feel. At the core of the issue came from Riot's demand for their employees to fit into the company's, quote, core gamer culture. While that doesn't sound like a horrible thing in and of itself, a game company hiring people who like video games, yeah, it's fucking revolutionary. In practice, at least in Riot's case, a core gamer was something very specific. Women were generally treated more unfairly during the interview process, having their gamer credentials called into question by their interviewers. Female Riot employees were consistently ignored and looked over during meetings, with one even recounting a time where she pitched an idea in a meeting, it got dismissed, and then a week later she asked a male colleague to pitch that same idea to the same people and it received an overwhelmingly positive reception. That same employee was also asked by her direct manager if it was, quote, hardworking at Riot, being so cute. 
Riot touted certain community values, like being ambitious, being open and honest, even to a fault, as a means to make the team better. What this translated to was basically a company culture that valued aggression over anything else. In an internal email leaked to Kotaku about creating a more welcoming environment during meetings, Riot co-founder Mark Morell stated that the company wouldn't bend backwards to accommodate people who couldn't speak up for themselves, and that perhaps they just didn't fit into Riot's culture. But several stories from female Riot employees claimed that they were passed on promotions and given negative evaluations because of behaving in a way that's similar to the male co Workers, the same ones who would be routinely praised for the exact type of behavior they were being punished for. One male employee told a story about a manager who would walk into meetings and if there were no women in the room, he would fart on his employees. I, I can't believe I have to say this, but you can't go around farting on your subordinates. Both male and female Riot employees recounted times when they were sent unsolicited pictures of genitalia on company email chains, as well as the reveal of an email being passed around by management about which employees they would like to sleep with. In the weeks after Kotaku's report, many former and current Riot employees cooperated with what was in the article, highlighting Riot's long history of sexual harassment and discrimination. Some of the more vocal and outspoken employees who criticized the company, like Matthias Lehman, even had the distinct honor of being fired and becoming a victim of a targeted online harassment campaign. The LA Times would conduct their own investigation into Riot Games in October of that year, finding many of the same issues that the Kotaku article unearthed. This culminated in a class action lawsuit that was filed against Riot Games in November of 2018. In May of 2019, 150 Riot employees would stage a walkout in response to the company's dismissal and attempt to sweep the allegations under the rug. It also marked the first time a walkout of this magnitude happened in the video game industry. Riot Games settled the lawsuit in 2019, offering to give out $10 million to any current and former female employees who worked for Riot since 2014. That same year, Riot employees were also open about the company making strides to fix its workplace culture. And just like that, sexism in the gaming industry was solved, and there was never another case- And then Riot backpedaled out of the settlement in March of 2021. Rockstar Games 2, Electric Boo 100 Hour Work Weeks, Glue. In October of 2018, New York Magazine ran a piece on the making of Rockstar's upcoming Red Dead Redemption 2. In it, Rockstar co-founder Dan Hauser spoke about the game having the most intense production of any Rockstar game so far, and this was coming from a company that was already notorious for its unfair work practices. Hauser also casually dropped that the studio had been putting 100 hour work weeks several times during the course of the game's production in 2018. While the comment was left unexamined by the article's writer, and Rockstar work culture wasn't discussed in depth in the New York Magazine piece, the internet latched on to Hauser's casual remark about the ungodly work hours. Hauser would then release a statement to Kotaku, clarifying on his comments. He would state that it was only the core writing team that did three weeks of intense work, and that quote, we have some senior people who work very hard purely because they're passionate about a project, but that additional effort is a choice, and we don't ask or expect anyone to work anything like this. I'm, I'm gonna stop you right there, Mr. Rockstar. First, notice the remark about passion, and let's not forget the words of Hiroshi Ayuchi. Second, anyone who's worked in a similar environment can attest to how the whole we don't require extra time thing is kind of bullshit. On paper, companies like Rockstar may not mandate overtime or working extra days, but the company culture basically requires it. If your bosses and everyone around you are working extra hours, you're gonna feel inclined to join them. And more often than not, you're looked down upon by your bosses and coworkers if you don't join them. A week later, several other Rockstar employees would join the conversation, after the company lifted its ban on work-related talk on social media, with a mix of reactions from, there was almost no crunch, to, we were forced to crunch. Hauser's claim that crunch was limited would also be contested when, only a few weeks after the initial New York Magazine piece, Big Daddy Schreier would conduct his own investigation into Rockstar's crunch culture. Yeah, they crunched way more than Hauser claimed. The picture that is painted is of a more complicated Rockstar than what we saw in 2010. Something we have to keep in mind here is that a company like Rockstar is gigantic, with hundreds of employees and dozens of offices all over the world. Experiences can vary greatly depending on which department, location, and manager any given employee falls under. Some spoke of great working conditions on Red Dead 2, some of the best they've ever experienced working in the industry. Others spoke of a culture of fear, coming into the office even on days 
they had no work to do just because it was expected that you would be there. Offices like Rockstar Lincoln and Rockstar's main headquarters in New York seemed to get the brunt of the shit work. The latter because it was constantly under the watchful eye of Rockstar's corporate executives and the Hauser brothers, and the former because it was where a large amount of Rockstar's quality assurance team was located. And to put a long story short, QA testers are some of the most overworked and underpaid people in the entire industry. QA are paid low wages, sometimes even minimum wage, and are contract workers, so in countries like the United States, they don't often have benefits like health insurance and work grueling hours including weekends, evenings, and nights. And to cap it all off, most QA are laid off the second the studio doesn't need them anymore. The QA department at Rockstar Lincoln had allegedly been working mandatory overtime for over a year before Red Dead 2's release, with multiple employees developing depression because of the oppressive work environment. One particular fun story came with a Rockstar Lincoln employee who went to their doctor about their depression, and after telling their doctor that they worked for Rockstar, the doctor replied, for God's sakes, another one. In Rockstar's defense, it did seem like they were attempting to fix these problems, although in a sort of tone-deaf way. The company invited Schreier to interview several employees about their experience, encouraged to be as candid as possible despite the fact that the company's head of HR sat in on every interview. Naturally, the stories Schreier heard in Rockstar's offices were noticeably more positive than the anonymous ones he had received. It's almost like people are scared to speak out about working conditions while their bosses are listening. But unlike some of the other companies featured in today's video, Rockstar does seem to have a vested interest in fixing their workplace culture. And at least as of May of 2020, it does seem like the company is taking the right steps to fix many of their problems. But don't worry, if that was a little too positive of an ending for you, you'll love the next story. EA, Bioware, and Anthem. It was a hotly anticipated release, a new IP from a studio who had been behind some of the most acclaimed RPGs of all time. A couple E3 trailers made it seem like Anthem was going to be the next leap in AAA action RPGs, a necessary chapter in the canon of video game evolution. Instead we got this. Anthem might be one of the best examples to showcase how publisher mandates and a culture of crunch can lead to a bad end product. Bioware had a history of excessive last minute crunch, even long before the EA days, which was referred internally as Bioware Magic. Ooh, you suck. Bioware magic basically just meant that even as a game's deadline looms large and the project seemed horrible, it would somehow work itself out in the end. Oftentimes, Bioware's games wouldn't take shape until the last months of development, while the team was experiencing excessive crunch. The problem came from the fact that Bioware had been responsible for so many hit games. Projects like Mass Effect and Dragon Age Inquisition had all been made under similar circumstances, with that last minute Bioware magic coming in to save the day. It had led to an attitude within Bioware's management. A belief that the Bioware magic, aka last minute non-stop and excessive crunch, was part of the formula that made a Bioware game a Bioware game. And then Mass Effect Andromeda came out. The objective failure of Andromeda had sowed doubts in many Bioware employees. Perhaps that Bioware magic wasn't the thing that made the game special, and the success of their previous titles came in spite of it, rather than because of it. But that didn't stop Bioware management from attempting the same thing on Anthem. The game's failure at launch, in its simplest terms, can be blamed on three things. Poor management on the part of Bioware's senior team, EA's mandate that the game would come out in March of 2019, and EA's insistence that all their subsidiaries use the Frostbite engine. Frostbite was developed by DICE for the Battlefield games. Its bread and butter were first-person shooters. As such, Bioware had to bend over backwards to get it to work for the type of games they made third-person, story-heavy action RPGs. There was very little internal documentation of Frostbite's inner workings, and because Bioware's games brought in EA significantly less money than big franchises like FIFA and Battlefield, EA's limited Frostbite team was set to help those projects rather than games like Anthem. Anthem spent seven years in pre-production, where Bioware management would fail consistently to land on a cohesive vision for the game. Employees spoke of hours-long meetings about story elements, lore, and mechanics where the team would disagree about the direction to go in, and unlike previous projects where a decision was eventually made by the end of the meeting, Anthem's pre-production meetings often ended with no one making a final decision, leaving the rest of the team to go work on a game with no clear idea of 
what it would be. This lack of any clear direction from BioWare's senior management team would eventually culminate with a dismal demo showcase to EA's then chief design officer, Patrick Sunderland. In December of 2016, Sunderland played a demo of Anthem and hated it. BioWare, already in a precarious position within EA due to the failure of Mass Effect Andromeda, went into damage control. Anthem pre-production essentially halted, and BioWare spent six weeks of hardcore crunch just to make a demo for Sunderland specifically. Luckily, the EA exec loved it, and that same demo was the one shown at E3 2017. Now, a demo made specifically for a trade show like E3 isn't out of the ordinary in the industry. What many people didn't realize, though, was that Anthem had not even exited pre-production when the E3 demo was shown. Many developers who worked on the game remarked how they didn't even have a clear idea of what the game was until they saw the E3 demo. With only about a year and a half before EA's mandate of a March 2019 release, the Bioware magic took over. Over the course of Anthem's production, turnover in Bioware was insane. Project leads and directors shifted multiple times, many developers who had worked for years at Bioware left the company, and the game's lead designer, Corey Gasper, tragically passed away in 2017. The crunch was in full swing at this point. Evenings, weekends, and overnights became the norm. All the while, Bioware management dismissed concerns from their exhausted employees, citing the old Bioware magic as the thing that would get them through the project. Several Bioware staffers would have to take stress leave, mandated by their doctors, and issues with depression and anxiety were rampant throughout the studio. Despite forming shape in the last few months like previous acclaimed Bioware games, Anthem was a critical failure. The Bioware magic that the studio thought Thought made their games great had actually destroyed one of their most ambitious projects, and the studio acknowledged that they were due for some systemic changes in their development process. How Fortnite almost killed Epic Games' is employees. Don't worry guys, the big corporation was probably doing better than ever. Fortnite is the culmination of the games as a service philosophy. The game's continuous updates, sometimes within weeks of each other, has kept Fortnite's absurdly large player base constantly engaged with the game for years. The game makes so much fucking money that people have become multi-millionaires just because they play it, and Epic CEO Tim Sweeney has a net worth of 9 billion fucking dollars. But what happens on the other side? What does it take for a game to constantly drop new features for years while also maintaining a player base that edges towards half a billion people. Well, it leads to a whole shitload of seemingly endless crunch dictated by Epic's executives to keep the player base constantly engaged and to keep that sweet, sweet microtransaction cash rolling in. An investigative report, written by Colin Campbell and published to Polygon in 2019, unearthed the grisly conditions that many of Epic's salaried and contractor employees had been constantly going through since Fortnite's launch. Interestingly, many of the Epic employees employees Polygon spoke to actually spoke positively about the company pre-Fortnite. Their salaries were good, bonuses were significantly higher than the industry standard, and work-to-life balance was generally okay. Then everything changed when the Carlton dancers attacked. Despite onboarding hundreds of new employees to deal with Fortnite's rapidly growing popularity, unreasonable deadlines set by Epic's managers and executives led to a situation where no amount of employees could make a difference. Problems had to be solved immediately, no shelving things for big patch updates. Constant features were required to be made, with the Fortnite team continuously jumping from one thing to the next with no rest time in between. 70 hour work weeks became the norm, with some Epic employees even reaching 100 hour weeks. Like every other company we've covered, Epic did not mandate overtime. But also like every other company we've covered, it was definitely required. Employees who refused to work weekends were regularly fired, younger and newer employees felt like they needed to work overtime or potentially miss out on promotions, and several people just straight up broke down crying because of the amount of work they had to do. You know, it's weird. I know some people argue that crunch culture isn't emblematic of the video game industry at all, and it's just a few bad companies that choose to operate this way, but you can take these stories that the Epic employees shared and easily apply them to Rockstar, EA, Bioware, or basically any other company that sees crunch culture as a necessary part of the gaming industry. It's almost like this problem is systemic or something. CD Projekt Red and Cyberpunk 2077 
But hey, it can't be systemic. Look at CD Projekt Red. They made a commitment to not crunching during the development of Cyberpunk 2077. And they managed to walk back on that promise while also mandating unpaid overtime at the behest of executives and shareholders who were set on a December 2020 release, which came at the cost of an ungodly amount of crunch that probably continues to this day. I'm starting to think something might be wrong with this industry. Ubisoft has a problem with sexism. Also, maybe the entire industry does, IDK. June of 2020 saw widespread allegations of sexual harassment and abuse, gender-based discrimination, and even sexual assault leveled against the entire gaming industry. Nearly 100 people took to Twitter to air their grievances, highlighting years of abuse, harassment, and discrimination they had faced or witnessed from both popular web personalities and game developers. Two of the names that repeatedly came up were Tommy Francois and Maximine Bayland, who both worked for Ubisoft as high-level executives. This revelation was would unearth widespread abuse and discrimination through the entire company, with many considering then Ubisoft Chief Creative Officer Sergei Askoe to be the prime source of all the horribleness. Askoe was alleged to make disparaging remarks about female employees, encourage drinking on the job, and even gave people pot brownies without telling them. I just want to point out that even Snoop fucking dog doesn't eat pot brownies, so yeah, not the kind of thing you want to give someone without telling them. Much like Riot Games, several former and current Ubisoft employees described a sort of frat house culture within the company. There was a boys club, and if you weren't in it, you were treated differently. Speaking to Bloomberg, one former employee recalled a time where she repeatedly went to HR about her manager, only to be dismissed time and time again. Finally, one time a male colleague joined her, and surprise surprise, this time HR actually did something about it and fired the manager. And to make it up to the female employee, they gave her a $200 visa a gift card. Beland allegedly choked someone at Ubisoft Toronto's offices. Francois was known to make homophobic jokes and give unwanted massages, reports to HR when ignored, and despite the number of complaints leveled against them, both Francois and Beland were promoted. Even the games were affected by this, with multiple reports that attempts to have a female lead in Assassin's Creed were shot down for years by Askue, who was convinced that female protagonists don't sell video games. In the fallout from the allegations, Francois was placed on leave and Beland and Askawe resigned. An internal Ubisoft survey revealed that 25% of Ubisoft's employees had seen or experienced workplace harassment. Despite a big show of the usual PR bullshit about trying to be better, recent news about Ubisoft shows that the company culture remains toxic. An expose from Kotaku in July 2021 revealed some pretty damning allegations leveled against Ubisoft Singapore, with former and current employees outlining years of gender and racial discrimination and abuse. But it can't be a larger systemic issue throughout the industry, right? This is emblematic of just one or, you know, two companies. It's not like there's another AAA developer out there with even more horrific stories of sexism. Activision Blizzard, and looking towards the future. As of the recording of this video, the most recent industry controversy comes from a series of reports and allegations leveled against Activision Blizzard. Like Riot and Ubisoft before them, it seems that the company is plagued by a culture of sexism, with regular discrimination against female employees. There were reports that male workers would dump their work on their female co-workers and fuck off to go play video games. There would be cube crawls where male employees would get drunk and then go harass the women in their office. And there was apparently a Cosby room, which brings up so many images of horror just from that name alone. As of the recording of this video, the Activision Blizzard story is still ongoing, with new, seemingly more horrific news being revealed every week. Because of that, I don't want to dwell on this stuff too much and make this video immediately outdated, but there are some important takeaways. On July 20th, 2021, the state of California filed a lawsuit against Activision Blizzard for workplace discrimination. Following the lawsuit, many former and current Activision Blizzard employees took to social media to air their complaints and history with the company, and over 2,000 employees signed an open letter to Activision Blizzard management, emphasizing that they won't stand for this kind of work environment anymore. Toward the end of July, employees at Activision Blizzard staged a walkout, a still rare move despite the widespread exploitation that goes on in the industry. As to whether or not this company will listen to their employees and actually change their company culture, remains to be seen. You know, reading through these stories back to back is pretty sobering. The working conditions that these people face in the gaming industry, while horrific, are not unique. 
There is a pervasive rot in the gaming industry, one that is gonna fight tooth and nail to stay as long as there's no way for these workers to have some kind of organized collective action. You know, I often find myself wondering what we can do about this as consumers. I don't know if we have any power to change any of this, but I do know that as more light is shed on these actions, the more these companies feel the pressure, the more they'll be forced to listen to their employees and hopefully change. So, especially as most gaming media sites seem to already be heading back to the status quo when it comes to covering these companies, I think our job as consumers, as the people who love the games that these developers have given up their lives for, is simply to pay attention.